Good morning, and welcome to our video devotion for Saturday, October the 24th, 2020. We are now less than a month till Thanksgiving and two months exactly until Christmas. I mean, the holidays are right here upon us. But before the rush begins, I'm glad that you took some time today to spend with me in Bible study. Throughout the last week, we've been looking at some of the things that have have happened to Jesus in uh, the town of Capernaum. These events are all recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to leave the town of Capernaum. We're going to stay in the area of Capernaum, and we're going to look at another one of these events that took place in Jesus' life. And this is found in Mark chapter 9, verse 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And listen to what God's Word says here. After six days... Now this observation, after six days, is a reference to an event that happened at a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is not too far from Capernaum. Now if you remember, at that place, Jesus asked His disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told Him, well, you know, some people say you're Elijah, some people say you're one Isaiah, one of the prophets. And then He followed up that question by saying, but who do you say that I am? And with that, Peter started, spoke up and boldly proclaimed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, that should have been one of the greatest days of Jesus' life. His disciples were finally beginning to understand who He really was. But the joy of that moment was tempered by what came next. Let's go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark 8, 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. You know, I don't think it's possible to describe what the disciples must have felt when they heard Jesus speak these words. They didn't want to think about the idea of Jesus dying. But there was more to it than the pain of losing a dear friend. Remember, Peter has just proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ, God's promised one. The disciples had been taught that the Messiah, the Christ, would live forever. He couldn't be killed. That was a contradiction in terms. The disciples would have left Caesarea Philippi confident about Jesus, but still plagued with some doubts concerning who he was and why he'd come to earth. And so notice what the Bible goes on to say there in in Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. You know, there's no doubt that Peter, James, and John formed something of an inner circle among Jesus' disciples. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why these three men had that status. All we know for sure is that, that that Jesus called him into his ministry, although Jesus also called the other disciples into his ministry. Interestingly enough, in the book of of Acts, virtually nothing is written of James. Now, you see, the James described in the book of Acts is actually Jesus' half-brother. And in the book of Acts, John is always clearly junior to Peter. Peter was the guy in charge. Well, notice what it says here. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. The traditional site for this event has always been Mount Tabor. But Mount Tabor is really more like a big hill than a high mountain. Most scholars believe that this Bible verse is actually referring to Mount Hermon, which uh, is located north of uh, Capernaum, and it's 9,232 feet high. That's a tall mountain. Well, Notice what it says next. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Now, it's really hard to imagine, or let alone describe, what happened during Jesus' transfiguration. The Bible says Jesus' clothes became a radiant white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. Now, if you really want to understand what's going on here, you really have to go to the other Gospels. Uh, The Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they give us a fuller picture of what happened during this this time. time. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, the Bible says, Then He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became as white as light. 
And then in, in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 29, the uh, Bible goes on to tell us, and he was pr- as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became bright as a, as, um, as a flash of lightning. Now, in thinking about all of this, some Christians believe that the transfiguration was a case of the divinity of Jesus that dwelled within him, escaping the earthly shell of his body. Well, the problem with this theory is that it violates the doctrine of the incarnation. Remember, the Bible teaches us that at all times, Jesus is fully God and fully man or fully human. In other words, believing that the Spirit of God, Jesus escaped his earthly body would suggest that Jesus was somehow more God and less human. Other Christians believe that the transfiguration was a preview of Jesus in his resurrection body. But that's not really likely because of what the disciples experienced on Resurrection Sunday. The disciples saw and and uh, Jesus and his, you know, he was resurrected. They saw him as being the same person that he had been before his death on the cross. If he had looked radically different the way that the Bible is describing him during his transfiguration, the disciples might not have recognized him as being Jesus. And I don't question for a moment that the Bible would have told us something about that. So that leaves us with that question What was the transfiguration? Well, Here's where we need to go back to the Old Testament and uh, Moses' experience at the top of Mount Sinai. Now, if you remember, uh, Moses had asked God for the privilege of seeing him in all of his glory. But God told him he couldn't do that because to see the glory of God would cause a person to die. So what what God did was he told Moses, he said, hide in the the rock, the cleft of the rock. I will pass by covering covering you with my hand until I'm passed by, and then you can see a reflection of my glory. Well, suffice it to say that was such an awesome experience that it left its impression on Moses' face. From then on, Moses had to wear a veil over his face because it was it was frightening to the people to see his, his face with this radiant beam about it. It was only when he was inside the tabernacle and he was face to face with God that he even removed the veil. Well, Moses' ex- his experience helps us understand a little bit about what was going on during the transfiguration. Remember, Jesus' transfiguration was not done to confirm anything in Jesus' mind. He already knew who he was and why he'd come to earth. Seeing Jesus transfigured before the disciples was for their benefit. It was to confirm who Jesus was. He was the only begotten Son of the living God. Let's go on to read verse 4 now. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now, if you want to, the Bible doesn't tell us what they were chatting about, but, uh, if you, but it does tell us a little bit more uh, in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, where it says, they spoke about his departure or death, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Let's go back to how Mark begins his story of the transfiguration. Remember he said after six days, he referred to this event that took place at Caesarea Philippi. Well, at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus told the disciples that he was about to be arrested and tried and sentenced to death on a cross. The disciples were unable and unwilling to accept what Jesus had told them. The Bible says that that Peter went so far as to rebuke or challenge Jesus for even bringing it up. Well, in that context, notice what James and John and Peter are being told, information that they would have later shared with the other disciples. God had spoken to them and said, listen to Jesus. He speaks with my authority. He's fulfilling my plan. It's like, God was telling these disciples to be more like Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah did not question or challenge Jesus. They were accepting and even supportive of Jesus as he faced his death, which is what God wanted the disciples to be as well. Well, notice what it says in verse 5. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
you know, Peter's reaction proved a, a few things here. One, he was really impressed by what he had just seen. And two, he couldn't, still couldn't quite grasp the necessity of a Savior who would have to die. You see, the shelters or tabernacles that Peter proposed would be places of worship set up to confirm that this was a holy place where human beings had encountered God. Just like Mount Sinai was holy ground, the place where Moses had had that life-changing experience with God. So Mount Hermon would be holy ground, the place that they'd had a life-changing experience with Jesus. But God had other plans for Peter, James, and John. Notice what it says in verse 7. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the crowd, clouds. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around. They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And with that, the transfiguration was over. As soon as the voice of God proclaims his truth, the earth doesn't shake, lightning doesn't strike, everything goes back to normal. And the disciples are left with Jesus looking the same as he always did. But you know what? Everything had still changed. Now the disciples knew beyond a shadow of a doubt who Jesus was. He was God's one and only Son. And they knew why Jesus had come to earth, to die on the cross for the sin of the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to spend some time in, in your word today. We thank you for the truth that we've discovered there. We thank you for this earth-shattering experience that Peter, James, and John had with Jesus. We thank you for what it means and what it tells us about, about, about who your son was and why your son came to die for us on the cross. And Father, my prayer is that today we will take that knowledge of who Jesus is and we will live with confidence and courage, putting all our faith, trust, and hope in him. And Father, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that will do it for today. I hope that you'll join us again tomorrow morning for our morning worship service here at 1030 in the, in the worship center in the sanctuary. Now, if you don't feel comfortable joining us here uh, or you won't be able to come for some reason, be sure to tune in to our live stream of the worship hour beginning at 1020 a.m. Until then, I encourage you to stay safe and I hope that God will bless you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.